Hey everybody, you're listening to the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Uh, today, had a good time. Got to sit down and talk to Eric James Morris. A uh, young man's an actor. You've probably seen him in a lot of different stuff. Uh, been going for a little while. Uh, also owns a company out of Atlanta. Um, and he, he's just an all-around great guy. He he's, he's a lot of fun to sit and talk to. And we're going to get to that here in just a second. But one thing I want to remind you all of is we're sponsored by Joe's Underground in Augusta, Georgia. They're at 8th and Broad in the bottom of the Lamar building. Now, right now, Joe's is doing like everyone else and kind of, you know, they're, they're having to close right now because of this pandemic we're in. And their people are having a little bit of a tough time. But right now, they're they're closed, but they're still selling T-shirts with a logo on it on the Facebook page. Yeah! Go to Joe's Underground. Yeah, that'll teach me not to put my phone on mute, won't it? But it was funny. And check them out. Get, get you a shirt. You know, help support them a little bit. Uh, when they open back up, everybody head down that way because there is going to be a party. It's going to be such a blast. I'm looking forward to being able to go back down there and have a good time with Jeremy and all the gang. Great drink specials, great food, just great company. Remember, I goes to Joe's and so should you. So now here is Eric James Morris and myself just sitting down having a good time here on the Smoke Meat Podcast. Hey everybody, you're listening to the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Today we got a special guest. We got actor Eric James Morris on the line with us. Uh, gonna talk about acting, uh, his regular business, and just we're gonna have a whole lot of fun today, just talking about random stuff. So take it away, Eric. How's it going today? Hey, Brad, it's going great, man. How you doing during man, this pandemic? Man, if I was any better, I'd be twins. What's not to <laughs> love? I'm an essential person who has to go out to sick people. Gotta love it. Yeah, man, we appreciate your service. I know it's got to be kind of tough, man, with uh, all this craziness man, with the COVID. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, it's killing me. But, I mean, if people would do what they're supposed to, stay in, and if they have to go out, at least wear a mask, you know, it, it wouldn't be bad. I had to go to the grocery store the other day, and I think I was one of five people in there that had a mask on. Really? Yeah. Wow. Man, uh, it is kind of awkward because uh, – you know, I know you just introduced me as an actor, which I am, but also I'm a business owner and uh, we do foundation repairs and waterproofing. So and I still I'm still looking at jobs during this pandemic, I guess, because a lot of people are home and um, they're trying to get things repaired or whatever. But uh, I've looked at several, I look at, you know, two or three a day and um, I uh, started wearing my respirator, not, not just a mask, but an actual half face respirator. Yeah, because we have them for more line of work and. Um, the first time I did it, I was like, man, I feel like a freaking idiot. You know, they're probably going to think I'm some kind of germaphobe. But after I've done it a couple of times, it's like, I don't even think of it twice about it. I just throw it on, go up and say hello. I just speak loud because they can't really hear me through the mat, you know, mm-hmm. and you can't see my mouth move. So it's kind of weird when you're talking to somebody. But um, once you do it once, man, it's no big deal. Yeah, the great, <laughs> great thing about the masks, though, you say they can't see your mouth move. You can yeah. say a lot of things that you don't really want people to hear, but you really have to say inside yeah. that mask. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awesome thing. With great power yeah. comes great responsibility, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, but yeah, man, you got to got to stay safe, man. Got to wear the mask and gloves, and you know, I never thought I'd see some crazy stuff like this. Oh man, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a spring chicken. I, I've been around for a while, and I didn't, I didn't expect to see this in my lifetime. I, you know, you hear about it, you read about it, you know, in school or whatever, but now we're actually dealing with it. And it's just like, man, what in the world? It's yeah. Crazy. I've been on an ambulance for almost 30 years and I've never seen anything like this, you know, and people aren't taking it serious now. They did it at the beginning and now, you know, because they're tired of being at home, they think, well, I'm not going to get it. And mm-hmm. we haven't hit the peak yet. Um, things are going to get really, really, really bad. And everybody just needs to do what they're supposed to do and stay at home. Yeah, it's kind of stir crazy, you know. It, I got uh, I talked to a few people, just friends and some family members, and you know, their just anxiety gets high, or you know, worried, stuck in the house, you know. It just kind of sucks, man. But uh, there's a guy that uh, I don't know him personally, but he's part of a Facebook cycling group that I'm a part of, and 
he posted a video and the long story short, uh, he said something of value. I thought it was kind of cool. It's just, you know, we've all heard this statement, but really take it to heart now is yeah, just take one day at a time, man. You know, each day is a new day. And just, just get through today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. So, that's what I do at home. I mean, I'm still looking at jobs, but my I'm limited. I don't do anything except I'll go look at a job, I'll wear the respirators and the mask, and you know I'll keep my distance, talking to people, and you know, come back. I don't do anything else. I don't go anywhere. I, I walked my dog for the first time last night. Oh man! So the only time I've really been out, you know, besides driving to somebody's house you know I, I, I have a lot of projects around my home i have a, a fixer upper house and i've uh, been remodeling since, remodeling since i bought it but i'm limited what i can do because i don't want to go to home depot either you know to buy a bunch of material so yeah you know just trying to stay busy man yeah I, i've relegated myself to the basement which is fine because this is where my little studio is you know i've got a video set up i do characters and that kind of stuff and i'll the other day, I did a one of my characters did the heat ball challenge. Um, made some okay. meatballs. I, I'm a pepperhead. Oh, uh, are you really? Oh, you I like am. Super hot peppers. Oh yeah. And I, oh, I'll tell you guys do that, man. It's crazy. Oh man, I, <laughs> I, I made these meatballs. They had jalapenos and habaneros that were fresh cut up in them, uh, but they also had um, Reaper powder and ghost pepper powder, habanero powder, uh, what what? Else? Scotch bonnet powder. They were ridiculous hot. Yeah, they did. And I've got a, a chef character, and his name is Rupert, and he talks like this, and he's got a big handlebar mustache, and wears a do rag and a chef's coat. <laughs> Rupert is awesome. <laughs> so I feel myself doing these, eating. I ate six of them. What? And while I ate six of them, I read and stayed in character. Brenda's beaver needs a barber, and it was amazing. <laughs> Oh yeah, man, this is insane, dude. That's uh, that's crazy. Man. I tell you, it was it was awesome. But I, I made a, a Amazon list and I published it to some people, and I basically put the, all of the hot challenges on there, and yeah, you know, put uh, some some of the mega hot sauces, and told everybody if you order something off this list, it comes to me. I will do whatever challenge it is and whatever character you want me to, and we, we'll have fun with it. And somebody has actually ordered two of the things. and One of them, I'm not sure what it is. The other one, I wish I hadn't put on the list because it's not hot. It's just nasty. Oh, man. And have, have you seen the Bean Boozled Jelly Beans? Uh, bean Boozled? Yeah. Jelly Belly puts it out. <laughs> I've never heard of them, man. No. <laughs> oh, man. For, for anybody that don't know, Bean Boozled, you have a little spinner. You spin the wheel, and it's full of Jelly Belly Jelly Beans. And you pick a color that you, you spin on, and it's either going to taste really good or they made it taste like something else, like the brown ones can either be yeah. chocolate pudding or canned yeah. dog food. I, I have seen that. I, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Well, I put the Extreme Edition on there, which has none of the good ones in it, Yeah. and somebody has ordered it for me. <laughs> oh, man, not good. Oh, that was going to suck, but I'm going to do it. And they got like a worm dirt uh, jelly bean or something uh, like they, that. They have brought back some of the old flavors. I know they've brought back skunk spray. Um, <laughs> the sour milk one is, oh, it is horrible. Oh, man. Yeah, That's... it's like taking just a chunk of sour milk and eating it. It is so nasty. <laughs> they got dead fish, stink bug. Oh, stink bug. That, that sounds gross, man. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is going to suck so bad. But people will laugh, so I can dig it. <laughs> Well, man, I tell you, you know, there's a there's an Asian restaurant uh, not too far from here, and uh, if anybody's listening that likes traditional Chinese food, it's called Tasty China. Mm -hmm. But uh, I haven't been there in a long time. But uh, they, they do traditional Sichuan Ooh. Chinese food. Okay, so I've never, you know, really experienced it till we tried this place, and and it's delicious, man. But you, have, I have to tell them, like, hey, man. You know, whatever you think is mild, divide that by two, and that's how much pepper needs to go in the dish, man. Yeah. It, it, it's so hot. I mean, you can't even – two bites, and the, the lips are, you know, numb, and, you know, I can't even – I can't feel my mouth. 
and you can't even enjoy it. I mean, one time we, <laughs> one time I ordered a dish, and uh, I couldn't even eat it. And so we just took it home. Uh-huh. And then when I got it home, I put it in the strainer, and I washed all the <laughs> all the peppers <laughs> off the sink, and then ate it. <laughs> yeah, I've I've got a gallon bag of those peppers in the freezer right now, and I Man. use those very sparingly. <laughs> yeah, it's uh. I don't see how uh, how you could do those things, man. I, you know, I like a little bit. Of, I like spicy stuff, man. But not, you know, I can't. If it's going to make my lips numb, nah, that's too much, man. Oh man, I, some of the things we've had. I've got a friend in Thompson, where I'm from, who he'll he'll take these challenges with me. And some of the things we've eaten. Oh man, um, have you ever had a century egg? That's, uh, what is it called? It's called a century egg. I've never even heard of that. It is the Oriental people. Take a duck egg, and the way that they uh, preserve it is basically they put lye and some other stuff on the whole egg. Yeah. And it pretty much makes the inside like one of the Jello Jigglers. But it's this black, <laughs> nasty, dark hunter green color. Yeah. And the yolk is a consistency of like toothpaste. It is, oh, it then stink. Yeah. Well, it makes kimchi smell good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and we, we've done those. We've done mountain oysters, which, by the way, mountain oysters are awesome. If you've never had them, I recommend it. Just forget what you're eating. They're amazing. Yeah, man, I don't know about that one. I, <laughs> that's, that's crazy, man. Yeah, we, we did those on a dare, and I, I when I was reading it, for those of y'all who don't know what mountain oysters are, pig nuts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got some of them, and, and I looked up how to cook them. And during paramedic school, we actually saw the inside of a testicle. They cut one in half. It was horrible. <laughs> Looks like a gizzard. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I couldn't eat gizzards for a long time after that. But I, I was reading how to get these things ready to cook, and it said if you boil them beforehand, be careful they don't burst. And I told myself, I said, if I go to slice into this thing and it pops, I'm just going to die right here. But it didn't. That's what I was going to say when you bite into it. It's like a... Like a, you know, like a cream-filled pastry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. That'd probably be the raw one. That would be horrible. Oh, man. I have some boundaries, and that one would be it. I'd, uh, <laughs> nope, got to cook them. <laughs> oh, my goodness, oh, man. man. But, yeah, we, we keep each other in check with the hot food because we'll, we'll get on kicks where we'll do these challenges. and I've got some... Some sauce that I made up. You remember the movie Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story? Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember every time he'd walk in on that guy doing drugs, he'd go, You don't want none of this shit, Dewey. <laughs> I, I made a sauce, and that's what I called it. Really? <laughs> and when we start getting low, we just add stuff to it, and this stuff almost burns the bottle now. Jeez, man, yeah. that's good. <laughs> I just don't. I don't say you guys do it. I have a brother-in-law. He's a, he was into that, like ghost peppers and stuff, mm-hmm. coming from a special region and all this other stuff. I'm like, man, forget that. That's just too hot, man. Something that you eat and you, your stomach's still hurting two days later. I mean, it's like <laughs> just not good, man. Oh, man, that, that stuff's probably why I'll survive the COVID epidemic. <laughs> probably, hey, man. Might be on the COVID. <laughs> but no, I, no I, I like eating spicy, but I, I I can cook spicy and make it actually taste good and not burn you to death. No, yeah, okay, but that's but, that's all right then. As yeah. long as you can do it, you know that's the thing, man. Yeah, uh, I, I, I got a wife and two girls. They do not do hot like I do. So <laughs> yeah. you got to bring it down a notch, huh? Yeah, but yeah. you know, I, I did a show in Griffin one night where. I got their hottest wing. They called it, uh, what was it? can't remember what they called it, but it was one the chef made for me. And I ate two of those and finished my act on stage. Those things were, oh, man, they were bad, but I did my act. <laughs> and it, it turned out good. <laughs> wow, that's cool, man. So you do stand-up you do stand up comedy? I do. I've done stand-up for almost 30 years here and there. You know, I've never gotten really big. I've just... I've only gotten paid once, but it was a, an amazing show. If if there's ever a show, a movie made of that night, Ben Stiller will star in it. That's how it went. Oh, sweet man! That's I'll, awesome. I'll, I'll give you that story because it's it's just so epic. All right, let's see. It was in Savannah, 
at a place called King's Inn. I don't think it's open anymore. Uh, if you don't know, King's Inn was a strip club. And it, it wasn't even a really good one. It was, it was on the back side of a strip mall. Oh, man. That's usually the best one. Huh? <laughs> oh, man. This thing. Oh, man. And the guy that, that ran the show, he was an ex-punk rocker who, who just considered himself to be extremely famous, but he, I don't think he ever was. <laughs> Okay. Well, we, we pulled up to the to the place about 6 o'clock when he told me to be there. And we walk in, and the bartender slash owner and one other guy's in there. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, he'll be here about 9. He always tells people to come early, and he don't show up till 9. So we're like, okay. And people started filtering in. We stood out front to smoke because he couldn't smoke in the bar, which, okay. They have some standards, whatever. Yeah. Uh, this guy rolls up. In the nastiest Miata I have ever seen. I mean, yeah. this thing looks like it should have had skid marks on the back of it. It was so nasty. <laughs> and he rolls out of this thing. He is heavier than I am, and I'm 300 pounds. Shorter than I am, with the worst. Co- His comb over was so bad, it looked like he was wearing a Kango hat. <laughs> and a burgundy members only jacket. I'll never forget it. It was so awesome. Man, that's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, he, he introduced himself, and he, he said, you know, if you don't have a hotel, you can stay at the mansion tonight. That's apparently what he called his house, and he let the comics stay there. Yeah. And I, I thought, no, if I, I stay there, I'm going to wake up in the morning with a headache and a belt around my neck. I'm, I'm not going there. <laughs> but he, he asked me, so what music do you like to go up to? And the Beastie Boys Sabotage gets me pumped, man. I vibrate when I listen to that song. I said, that one. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he went on inside, and we had one of the strippers that wasn't working. She was hanging out with us, talking to us. Okay, she was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Went inside, they had three working. Here is the hierarchy of the three that were working. One, you could tell she had danced before somewhere and just thought she was something else. And she was something else. Yeah. Another one, you could tell she was brand new. And the third one came walking out of the back in this lingerie that matched Homeboy's Miata. It looked like the tailgate of a white pickup truck after you rode on a wet road. Yeah. <laughs> Holding her nose and blood just pouring out of it. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's no. Oh, and it, it had gotten on the front of the, the lingerie and all night long, it, she just kept that on. She was good. Man, what she like this? Keep a rag on the nose. The <laughs> no, it, it finally stopped, but it was oh, it was horrible. And the, I tried to do a dance and pinch her nose on the red bear. <laughs> the, they had six openers, and he gave them each like twenty minutes. Which, really, man, come on. Yeah. And uh, the stripper that kept talking to us was in the back, lip syncing their act. Wow. She, she told us that they're here every week. And they tell the same exact thing. Man, it's new material. I mean, they didn't even turn the jukebox off for these folks hardly. They turned it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they finally introduced me, and the bastard played Barry Manilow for me to get on stage to. Really? Instead of the Beastie Boys. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> oh, that was so miserable. But it was such fun. It was hilarious the whole night. Well, yeah, Ben Stiller will definitely be in that. Damn, that was a good time, man. I'll tell you what, you know, that kind of sounds like a strip club. There's one here in Atlanta that's been around forever. It's called uh, Claremont Lounge, and uh, I've heard of it. I've never been there. Man, well, you know, it, it's known for, you know, it's not known for the high quality strippers. Just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Sam Dollar General has a strip club. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the original Dollar General, been around forever, you know. Because, <laughs> man, I tell you, uh, yeah, man, I, I, <laughs> I tell the story, but I'm my wife doesn't hear. But uh, I, uh, <laughs> I was sitting there one night when I was about, I was maybe 21. I was fairly, you know, I was young, new to new, new to going to club, you know, and sitting in there and. They served beer in the can, you know, and mm-hmm. um, what they had was past Blue Ribbon, the hey. Budweiser, the thing is where they had. And uh, so we got us a couple of beers and sitting there at the bar, and there's this lady, this stripper, 
and she was every bit of maybe 60 years old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she looked like just like Tina Turner. She had uh, this wig on, and you know, it was kind of cool. It was just like, oh, this is kind of neat, man. It's like Tina Turner up in here, you know. And she's talking to me, she's sitting over here on the stool beside me, and um, she like. She's playing with her. She's, you know, touching herself, you know, and she says, and she tells me she's like, uh, you know, I, I think I'm turning tricks tonight. And I was like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> like good for gonna, you. I think it's time for me to go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I'll never forget that. And that lady is, uh, she's actually well known at the Claremont Lounge. That is, she's kind of a legend. She's been there forever. Um, I think she is still there. A friend of mine does talks about the Claremont in one of his bits. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about a really, really old stripper that was walking over there to him, shaking her hips, and one of them came out of joint, and she just kind of moved a little bit and popped it back in. <laughs> so Maybe the same person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot to catch me off guard when he told me about that. I about died. I'm like, really, man? He's like, yeah, that really happened. Uh. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? She might still be at it, man. Um, it was a long time ago. So that, that might be a true story. I don't know. <laughs> God bless her. Uh, yeah, you know. Stay at it, you know. <laughs> and the good thing is, she's probably still working because if you go to the Claremont, you're probably immune too. So, yeah, you gotta be, man. That's uh, you've not been exposed to everything there is, man. So, uh, goodness, but that place turns into a dance club, uh, some nights of the week. It's, it's like some nights of the week is a strip club, the other nights of the week, it's just like a social club or whatever, you know. That's it's a unique, legendary spot. If it, anybody's ever in Atlanta, I want to can't think of nothing better to do you want to check out something just, just go there it's down our, off of I think it's Ponce de Leon near downtown <laughs> uh-huh. yeah man so it's a legend I actually saw a candle that uh, you know they make the scented candles with different specialties I saw one that was called A Night on Ponce oh yeah <laughs> yeah I didn't have the nerve to smell it I'm like I cannot uh, smell raw yeah, sewage and shame and Gina Tay yeah. It's almost scratching sniff, man. It's still looking like that. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> yeah, I'm fairly new up here. I haven't explored Atlanta a whole lot. Yeah. But what what I have seen is just it, it tickles me. Because <laughs> you, know, you, you can see anything up there. I saw an old guy riding a scooter in the street. He wasn't on the sidewalk. One of those hover rounds and was yeah. passing people. I <laughs> wasn't. I've never seen one that would go that fast. It was amazing. Was it the skateboard, the electric skateboard? Not like right? the like the rascal. Like a little. Yeah, like the old person scooter. Oh. <laughs> and he was passing people. <laughs> the rascal. <laughs> I was like, son of a. <laughs> <laughs> he must have. He must have. Had... You got to you got to suit up. Maybe they took it to Monster Garage or something. You got a nitrous kit put in there. <laughs> Man, I, don't, I don't know if he had weed eater engines on that thing or what, but it was a beast. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. I had a friend of mine when he was a uh, long time ago for his son. You know, he had when his son was a little little kid, and he had a he had them little battery operated cars you can get for your kids, or you know, like a little Jeep, a little plastic Jeep. It's got a motor in it you know mm-hmm. well uh he took the battery out and put like a like a high voltage amperage you know car battery or whatever, something in there and <laughs> says, man <laughs> it's something there he'd, he'd just, be, just do a constant burnout up the street but in plastic wheels <laughs> 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 that thing went all foot, man oh that stuff is hilarious oh it would not have done for me to have one of those when i was a kid I, I probably wouldn't even be here today. The worst I had was a big wheel. Yeah, hey, that's bad enough, man. You know, you got three-wheel choppers. You got to watch out how fast you need turns, man. Oh, yeah. See, it was, you, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but I know I was raised in the era of the three-wheeler. Oh, yeah, man. I, yeah. I buddy my had a three-wheeler. <laughs> I survived the three-wheelers. A Honda Big Red. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. 
And uh, ironically, my friend uh, that had the three wheeler, we were riding, and I was riding a little a dirt bike, and he was riding his three wheeler, and his another buddy of ours was was on the seat with him behind him. Mm-hmm. And he hit a bump or something, and my buddy's on the back. His leg went under the back tire. Oh, oh man, yeah, not good. I mean, it it. it it, it took the skin off and I broke his leg. I mean, he was it messed him up. But I took his damn leg off. Yeah, that'll leave a bruise. That's oh yeah, that'll leave a bruise. <laughs> but that's my memory of three wheelers. I never seen seen him tip it over or crash. And what you hear about on the news, everybody was you know flipping it and killing themselves. But yeah. that's what I remember about the three wheelers being dangerous. Was that? Oh yeah. Well, um, you, uh, we was talking earlier. You, you do some acting. You know what? What all have you done here lately? Well, um, I've been acting about, I haven't been that long. I started maybe about four years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, I've, I've been a musician my whole life. I p- always play guitar, and um, I started singing later in life. But uh, when I was a teenager or a kid, I started playing guitar when I was about 12. And I had a stepdad at the time. I had a stepbrother that was older than me. And um, he played, and I started just playing guitar too. And I just mm-hmm. really could do it and enjoyed it. I uh, was a punk, you know. I was in the skateboards and just whatever. Yeah. You know, I, and uh, so I, later on, we got into. I had this little punk rock man uh, called the Wish Doctor, and we uh, we were actually kind of pretty good, you know. We could be some, you know, young teenagers, and but anyhow, we uh. Later, this long story short, I grew up, you know, <laughs> and uh, got out of that mess. And uh, I still play guitar. And then later in life, I, was, I got into doing uh, acoustical one-man jam type things. I mm-hmm. played restaurants, bars, fairs, stuff like that. And I, uh, so I've always been a musician. I've always enjoyed uh, entertaining, you know, doing a performance or giving the audience something. And later in life, my son... Uh, I had a, I have two sons actually. They're grown now, but when they were younger, one of them he had an interest in acting, and we didn't know anything about the industry, me and my wife. So we used to had his, you know, got him an agent and got him some uh, modeling and headshots done, stuff like that, and um, hmm. he started had, started doing background work. And this is about the time when filming in Atlanta was really starting to kick off. I mean, the Vampire Diaries was being filmed here, is when it was like in the early seasons, like season one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a few, a few other well-known shows, The Walking Dead, it just really got started here. And um, so you know, Hollywood was starting to come to Georgia at, the, at this time. So my son was doing some background work. He was on The Vampire Diaries and stuff like that. And, um, you know, but to him being a minor, one of us had to be with him on set. And one night there was a young independent filmmaker that was trying to do a project and my son was going to be a featured guy in the in this bar scene and so we were we were both there that night and we uh a lot of his background talent for this thing that they didn't show up it was raining really bad he had a bad location you know plus jesus he was an independent you know film guy it's hard to get people when you're not really paying any money anybody show up so, so he asked me and my wife if we would just kind of participate just had like we're in a bar i'd like to talk and that kind of thing this is background town, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. So, this lady that's done it several times, she was there, and she's like, "Okay, just look at me, and you know, we're going to act like we're talking, but we're not actually talking, you know. But we're going to just say stuff to each other, like we're having a conversation." And she was like, "Just count the months, or count to ten, and move your hands and nod your head a little bit, like we're talking, but don't make any noise." Mm-hmm. Like, okay. <laughs> so, anyways, that's what we did, and then um, later that night, the director guy. He's just talking to me, and he says, uh, "He said, hey, man, you ever done any acting before? And I said, no. Oh. And um, he says, well, you should look into it. And I said, okay. And he says, uh, you have an important look. That's what he told me. And I, I didn't – I was taken back by that. I'm like, what does that even mean, you know? <laughs> yeah. important. You know, so I, I just kind of – I took it as a compliment, and uh, it just kind of stuck out of my mind. I didn't really do anything about it at the time. My son, as time went on, he uh, – grew out of the and he his interest for acting just kind of dissolved he, he was playing football in school and the, the amount of time you have to dedicate to the to the industry is just ridiculous and mm. it's 
it's hard to commit because it's so wishy-washy, it's hard to schedule anything. And my son saw that early, and then he went to a few auditions in person, and he really bombed. And I think it hurt his, uh, his, you yeah. know, it hurt his ego, and he just gave up. I don't know. It's not for everybody, man. It's tough. Yeah. But I kept with it. I I actually was like, well, you know what? I want to look into this, and I went and did some background work on set. I I went and did a few. Uh, I don't remember where they were, but they were. There's a couple of uh, background casting companies here in Atlanta. One of them's really big called Central. Uh, mm-hmm. I got registered with them guys and went on some sets, some bigger projects. Um, and it sucked, but it, I saw how uh, projects work, how professional sets are run and what it's like and all this other stuff that you don't need to see. So it was nice to see that, but you know, I, I didn't like it because I was spending – the whole day you know sitting around in a room or somewhere just i mean literally just hanging out with nothing to do for 10 to 12 hours you know been there uh, the food was good you know they had really awesome uh, catering I mean, it was off the chain they'd have like salmon and you know i mean that's just high-end delicious uh lunch man i'll tell you what but uh i started doing some uh some acting classes we had a i found a studio that was close to where we lived at the time and I just kept going, and uh, actually, I met, ironically, through my business, I met a guy that uh, he, I was looking at a property he was thinking about buying, and we, we got to talking about acting. Somehow, he mentioned he was from Hollywood or Beverly Hills area, and he uh, was in acting, so I started asking questions, and he, he could tell I was interested, and he used to train at a studio that's well known it's called the uh, beverly hills playhouse Mm -hmm. out there in los angeles and uh, at the time i didn't know what that meant but i do now that's that's very prestigious acting school it's not easy to get get into but that's where he was from and that's where he had trained and so uh he was teaching part-time at a local studio that was close by and that's how i heard about the studio that was in my area Mm -hmm. so i went and and when I started trying to act and trying to learn how to act, it was like one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, and I like it. <laughs> so I, uh, I enjoyed the challenge. I enjoyed getting up on a stage and, you know, uh, putting, on, putting on a performance and taking on a character and, and just being aware of, you know, that you are a character and how to live truthfully through the character and, and, and have an audience believe that and make them feel something in the process. I tell you, it's an art, you know, um, people watch TV and, you know, there's, you watch a Netflix show, any of them, and you see one little part of a some, some cop that just, all he said was, you know, we got him, sir. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to think now, 300 people probably auditioned for that small thing, you know, as everybody and that guy's been working his butt off to get the opportunity to opportunity to even get that audition let alone even book it. It's not easy. It is so hard to get anywhere as an actor, but you have to really enjoy it because the the amount you put into it versus what you get out of it, sometimes it can seem to get way out of balance. Man, you know, pe- people just don't realize, you know, that one little line, you may have had to say that 10 times from different oh, angles and everything else. You know, it's, or you'll say it to somebody that's not even there. Yeah. I mean, it's, they'll just take your shot. Uh, I've done that several times where I've done a whole, man, I, there's a movie I've been shooting for a while. It's a Western. Uh, we're not 100% complete, but uh, I'd say majority of my scenes, I'm not even looking at my other character. I'm looking at a, a, a spot mm-hmm. because he's not even there. Yeah, uh, you know, so, and, and you have to make it seem real. But when you watch that, when you edit it back, you know, it, I mean, it, it does if if you – or comfortable with it. You have to train to do that. That's why acting is hard. You have to really, you have to train this. People think they're going to just be discovered because they look nice or, um, you know, I'm going to be the best thing ever. What your Hollywood sees me. Uh, just dream. Yeah. It's, never, it's just not reality. It is a, it is an art form. And it's really tough yeah. and you got to really love it. And, uh, it can bear on you when you do a lot of it. And lately I've been, taking a break i mean not just because of the pandemic <laughs> it, the industry has dramatically slowed because of the pandemic there's you know there's not just everything's on hold right now but even before that i was kind of backing off 
not pursuing a lot of stuff, you know, because I, I, I could get overwhelmed and uh, doing independent projects, things like that. I used to submit myself to projects all the time uh, for parts, and and then I'd get them. And, and then if I've got too many going on at once, and then I'm trying to run my company at the same time, it just can be a huge problem. And it, and it, it was getting to where, you know, I hope actors don't think I'm trying to, you know, brag or some crap, but I, I've i gotten where, where I get where, where I get an audition, and where most actors get happy about it, I'm like, son of a bitch, another wrong version, you know? Yeah. And it's because I was committing myself so much, and I, I knew I couldn't commit. I didn't have the time to, to dedicate to it. And But I would do them. So what I've done lately is I've quit submitting myself, and I just have my agency, whatever they send me, I'll do those, mm -hmm. you know, because those are going to be – Usually, uh, you know, well-paying projects, uh, things like that, are really hard to book anyways. I mean, they're, you know, just for shows that you've heard of. Uh, so you're competing with major league talent. And for somebody like myself, my age group, my type, you know, and I've only been doing this four years, most of the other guys that I'm competing with have been doing this for a lot longer than me. So they're really, really good at this. So my competition is really heavy when I get into the professional market. Mm -hmm. I mean, like uh, some of the shows that, you know, that you would know. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff. I don't off the top of my head. Yeah, I know I saw McGovern. What's that? I know McGovern was one. Yes. Um, McGovern. Uh, there's some other uh, stuff. I've, I've auditioned for a lot of different shows. I mean, um, a lot of them. Um, I'm trying to think of Sanction Centers. There's uh, Tyler Perry's got a few of them. I can't remember all of them, but a lot of those. Um, I don't know. There's a bunch of different ones. I auditioned for uh, American, what's that, American Made with Tom Cruise. Yes, I watched yeah. that about two weeks ago for the 15th yeah. time. <laughs> there was a co-pilot uh, co -pilot part in there that I auditioned for. It's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. This was back when I first got into it. And uh, I was like, man, I was like, this be cool, but I, I don't know if I'm, know if I can, know if I'm up for the challenge, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it was a big, big deal. But it, you know, so but so yeah, you audition a lot, and as an actor, I mean, you should be auditioning. And, uh, auditioning is just getting an audition is really the goal as an actor. Forget about booking. You know, it's nice to book. But it's just not reality. You'll you'll audition a thousand, you know, well, not a thousand times, but you'll audition a lot before you book one thing. Mm -hmm. Even as an, even in independent films, unless you're just what they're looking for. And uh, locally, I, there's been some independent directors that just come to know who I am as an actor. And I've had some people just ask if I'll be in the project, and I'm like, yeah, you know, because because there's a character they think that that I'm gonna bring well because of my my type I'm, I'm what they're looking for you know and they just happen to know who i am mm -hmm. uh, the casting process can be a pain in the butt um and that's why you know your bigger projects they always hire a casting director and that's what you go through through actors access and these other um, ways that you where these castings come from or through known casting directors see i got really lucky on the two movies i was in I basically fell into both parts. And uh, both of them, I mean, neither one of them were speaking, both of them were background, but uh, you remember Fled? Yeah. Um, I was in that. When cool. they were zipping up the body bag after the prison break, that's mm -hmm. my arm. <laughs> and, oh, and I'm in the background talking to some deputies because I'm one of the paramedics there. Okay. And the other one was uh, The Mark. It was a little independent thing filmed in Augusta. And they needed, once again, background medics. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm in that. That's awesome, um, man. I, uh, a lot of times, you know, they'll look for, you know, they for background stuff. And sometimes even beyond, you know, featured background or, you know, where it's a little bit where you're, you're not just in a crowd. You're like really a tight shot. Yeah. Uh, they'll look for uh, real professionals, like a, to a real paramedic or a real fireman, real, well, real police officer. Yeah. Stuff like that. And, and the neat thing it. is, it was a really, really good movie, but the mistake they made is they opened on the same weekend as Independence Day. 
Yeah, uh, you know, and there's a lot of good films, unfortunately, that come out that are competing with a heavy hitter at the same time. And yeah. I see that a lot. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, was that because it was easier to open at the same day of another big blockbuster? Or is it because it was just an accident? I mean, but I've seen that happen a lot. And that's That's got to suck. Yeah, yeah. But I am on DVD now, though, so. And I found that's myself cool. on Netflix one night, so that was cool. Yeah, that's cool, man, when you can turn on the TV and you see yourself, you know. It's uh, it's a neat thing when it happens. Yeah. Um, doing commercials, you know, I've done some commercials as well. and Those are uh, those are cool because a lot of times I, won't, I don't really watch a lot of TV. Mm-hmm. And I'll hear about it from a friend. Or somebody that'd be like, man, I was getting ready for work this morning, and then I heard you, and I looked over, and I was, there's Eric on the TV, you know. So that, <laughs> those those kind of moments are really, uh, really cool. Yeah. And that that part is fun, but to be honest with you, I don't even like to see myself on uh, anything. Like a lot of stuff I've, that I've done, I, I won't even. I don't even like to watch it. Yeah, I used to tape my stand up, and I, I still do video it now. And for a long time, I could not listen to myself or watch myself, and yeah, I heard exactly. somebody say that's how you're going to improve. You've got to power through it and watch it and see what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I noticed some things that I'll do for PD Day on stage. I'm not realizing I'm doing, and I'm like, oh crap, I need to stop doing that. And that, I worked on that. Yeah, that's that's good advice. I mean, definitely, it is good to watch, especially when you're auditioning. Uh, like, you know, a lot of people say don't watch your auditions because you're going to never approve of it. And that's the problem. You you are your own worst critic. Yeah. But um, but there is a time, like you said, you need to watch and whatever bad habits. We all have them. Uh, there's a lot of little bad habits that actors have, comedians, everybody that's doing a performance of some sort that you don't realize you're doing, um, whether it be something simple like you, you know, talking with your eyebrows all the time you're using you're getting over expressive because you know you're on camera uh there's a lot of things that people will do they don't realize they're even doing mm-hmm. until the camera goes. um there's something like i struggle with my accent you know i have a country accent it's just i'm from i'm from you know i'm from atlanta but some people are like well you're from texas <laughs> you know and i'm like i used to live in texas ironically i did but so I got it from both angles, but I, I lived out west of Atlanta most of my life, which is a, uh, some, you know, it's a rural, rural place. It's, you know, it's country. You know, it's kind of uh, close to Alabama, man. So, you know, you kind of oh, yeah. take on that Alabama talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you have all your teeth. You can read on at least a fifth grade level, so we know you're not Bama. I said, well, you know, hey, man, you know, <laughs> the Alabama's, man, they get a bad rap. But, um uh, <laughs> So, you know, as an actor, it's tough because um, a lot of times they don't want people with a southern accent, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, because there's a stereotype associated with that. Now, the other times they do want to have a southern accent. But with me, you know, if you want a southern accent, you know, it's kind of, I have to, I'm not, I don't look like I should have a southern accent, you mm-hmm. know, so I have to either change the character, which I can if, if I had some time to prepare to, to fit the look for a Southern accent character or when I'm playing the kind of guy that shouldn't have an accent, I have to really practice that and try to not sound, you know, like I'm, you know, from, from, from the country. (laughs) Yeah. I've I've been, been doing some characters on YouTube just for something to do, you know, and all of them are, I I didn't know what the character was going to be until they either put on the wig or the mustache or whatever. And everything I did was improv. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, go, go on my YouTube. It's Brad's comedy, all one word. You'll love them. Okay. Yeah, but one of my it, favorite man. ones is named Coach Dan Graham. You remember the old in the eighties? The every college coach had their little show on Sunday mornings on TV. Yeah, uh, vaguely. I, I do remember. I was a kid, but I, I I remember. Well, Coach Dan, he he's that guy that's way too overzealous about football and everything and he he don't have his own team mm-hmm. but uh he he he, he reminds me i kind of got the south alabama thing going for him you know he, he's coach dan graham you know he, he does it all for the kids you know it, it's all for the kids <laughs> you know, and 
I can fall into that accent with him, and I can just roll with that for days. I'll catch myself doing it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but he is so much fun to do. As a matter of fact, the Bean Boozled thing, uh-huh. the person that got it wants me to do let Coach do that. So. <laughs> That's the that's that's hilarious, man. I I enjoy comedy, but I'm not a comedian. Yeah. You know, I, I like to play comedy if I can get a part of this in a comedic project. I have fun mm-hmm. with it, and but I'm better at you know over the top comedy. You know, not not subtle, not not subtle. Yeah, more, more for really brothers than Woody Allen. Yeah, Jim Carrey. You know, yeah. I mean, large type comedy. You know, that's. I can do that, but yeah. I can't do the, the the stuff that's just naturally funny in a subtle way. I just, I just it isn't me. It's just not my personality. Yeah. Doesn't read well, you know. I play uh, but usually some sort of a kind of a bad guy and um, you know, maybe a you know creepy kind of guy, uh, an affluent guy, you know, uh, affluent creepy guy is even better. Yeah, um, stuff like that. I, I, I tend to gravitate towards those types of guys, and it's just because of my love. That's all. You know, I just did a podcast with Ed O'Halloran. Not, not Ed. Um, what did I say? Ed with Jack O'Halloran, uh, and he. That's pretty much what he's played his whole career. You know, he was oh, yeah. he was non in Superman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he played uh, Amo Muzz and Dragnet, the big bad guy. Yeah, and. Played um, Simon Moon in Hero and the Terror with Chuck Norris. Huh. So I mean, that's a, that's a pretty neat niche to get into. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being the bad dude. Um, you know, it, a lot of guys that started out as uh, the bad guy or whatever, um, as they gain as they gain traction in the industry, they'll they'll try other characters and, and come out of that, try to get out of the stereotype a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you remember even McConaughey. He was in a long time ago. He was in one of the Texas Chainsaw Chains, Chainsaw Massacre movies, and he had the mechanical leg. You know, y'all, you remember that that one? I don't remember which which one. It's mm-hmm. Chainsaw Massacre something. You know, yeah. four, three, two. I, I don't know. But he had the mechanical leg, and he's you know he was part of the family and stuff like that. So when you look mm-hmm. what he's done, I mean, he's done all kinds of stuff. It's definitely not anything related to being a a bad guy, you know? yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, I've always told other actors, and, you know, anybody that you know, to find your niche and whatever that is, man, and just go with it. Yeah. You know, just, I mean, it's that's what you know. You, whatever casting sees you as, that's what you have. That's what you have to go on. You can't really. Everybody's not going to be the Brad Pitt, you know. Um, or whatever it's you know you got to be where you get in where you fit in is probably the best way to say it yeah you know like i'm i'm not a brad pitt at all i'll never be a leading man but i'm an amazing brad pittman (laughs) (laughs) well you know uh brad brad pitt i mean a lot of people are not a a true you know leading man a lot of guys think they are Mm -hmm. but uh you know if you read uh brad pitt's story i mean it's pretty impressive I and mean, it didn't like it wasn't given to him you know he, it's plenty of uh you know attractive faces in hollywood you know but he just uh they you know they struggled it was him and what uh i forget the other guys but they're they did pretty well too all of them you know they struggled they were in there living in uh apartment together and doing the hollywood grind man you know yeah. but they stayed with it and didn't let uh all the negatives and all the nose get him down with J- Jason uh, was it Jason Priestley yeah I think it was yeah he, he was one of those guys well, yeah well maybe one day I'll get into acting a little bit more I'd, I'd love to do it I actually before all this hit I um, was sent some sides of a script yeah for a sitcom here in Atlanta and they asked me to audition it was just kind of out of the blue and it was from the videos that I've been doing on YouTube oh cool and I, I sent in, uh, I read for two parts, and I haven't heard anything back because everything's kind of, like I said, a standstill. But I'm assuming that I got it because that's what brought everything in the nation to a standstill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if I got it, this hit. 
but uh, you know, do it, man. If you like it, it's uh, it's 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 a cool thing. You have to really enjoy the, you know. Yet, I've told, I, I said this before in other interviews, and it still holds true. But it's just, uh, it's not for everybody. A lot of people think they want to be an actor, but you know, it's uh. It's a tough thing, man. It's not easy. You have to really just have fun with it and not give a damn. Mm -hmm. I hate to sound that way, but that's really the best advice I could give anybody. That's, it, it, that's what I did when I started doing better in comedy. Yeah, just don't give a shit. You know, I'm, you know, I'm sorry about the Don't give it. You know, nope. don't give a crap <laughs> hey. about what other people think. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, and uh, don't worry about the people who don't approve of you and they think you're no good. Or you're not booking the show, um, you can't let that eat at you because it will eat you a lot if you let it. Yeah. It will, and a lot of that's why that's where the drugs come in. That's where the suicide rates come in. That's where all that stuff comes from. It's and and sometimes actors, the type of people that are gravitated toward towards it, uh, they're they are they care too much. That they, 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 it's hard for them to to be able to say, I don't really, I don't give a damn what you think, mm -hmm. you know. Because they do. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they're actors, you know? Yeah. They're performers, and they, they want to do a good performance. So it's it's tough. It's a challenge. But you, so but if you can get past that, like you just said, and get to where you truly just do not really care, you still would do a good job. You still try. I'm not saying don't yeah, show you, up. You care about your craft, you know? but you're doing it for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you do it for you. And don't worry about it. They don't like it. It's okay, man. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. It, no matter how far you get in this as a actor or musician comedian whatever there's always going to be some people that just don't like you mm -hmm. just the facts man you know and who cares yeah definitely <laughs> well let's wrap this thing up a little bit yeah i done took up a boatload of your saturday afternoon well i'm just chilling at the pandemic man i'm just uh like i said just hanging out and just was writing some estimates, oddly enough, just chilling on the couch, man, yeah. watching YouTube. So it's not bothering me, man. But, but yeah, I appreciate you having me on your show. Hey, I appreciate you coming on, man. I've had a ball. Um, we, we can do it again whenever you want to. You got my number. All you got to do is holler and say, hey, fat boy, let's talk. <laughs> Damn, okay. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> well, cool, man. You Hey, if you do some comedy in Atlanta, you know, you need to let me know now that – they got some good places. I'm sure you know. They got the punchline, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, Laughing Skull. Yep. Uh, Laughing Skull, Dad's Garage. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few places, you know. So, um, definitely, if you decide to do one up here, let me know. I'll come. I definitely will. Well, I appreciate it, man. And everybody, this has been a fun talk. Y'all just keep listening. Enjoy this podcast. And we are out of here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Take care. Hey.